Have you ever heard people talking about CPUs and then mention words like assembly language and machine code? Hey there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Even though I have a bit of a cold, today I want to explain to you about how CPUs work in terms of assembly language and machine code. So if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. So really this is part two of a series of videos that I'm gonna be making about how CPUs work. And I do have a first video which talks about the very basic ideas of how uh, stored program computers take an instruction from memory and they decode them and execute them and then maybe write back something to the memory. And I'll link to that video in the description below. And at the end of that video, I talked about how I'm gonna show you how to write some actual assembly code, which you can then use an assembler to create a program so you understand and the fundamental instructions that happen at the lowest level on a CPU. So to do that, we're gonna use a Raspberry Pi and we're gonna write a couple of short assembly programs assemble them and then actually run the program. Now at this point you might be thinking, well I'm not a programmer, I don't wanna know about this kind of thing and you might be tempted to switch off, don't do it because I do recommend that you watch it because it will give you an insight into how the fundamentals of a CPU works. Think about these demonstrations you see maybe when an engine has been sliced in half or some other computer thing has got a transparent screen on it. You can see what's going on inside and that in itself is interesting even if you don't understand the very, very minute details. So do carry on watching because I'm sure we've all got something to learn. Okay, so here we are on the Raspberry Pi and the first thing we're gonna do is write a program that prints hello world and we're gonna do that using assembly language. So the first thing we do is create our source file and so it's gonna be called hello and because we're using an assembler, you use .s for source file. Okay, so we do nano hello.s and that gives us up a blank file here. Now, uh, assembly files are a bit different to let's say C files or Python files. The first thing we have to do is define what's called the data section, which tells us where all the data for the program will be stored. And in this case, we only have one thing that we want to store and that is the word, uh, a string for hello world. And you define that by do, creating the label string and then creating, you say that it's ASCII. And then we wanna say here, hello world. So if you notice here, this is very much low level compared to let's say uh, C or Python. And that's it for the data section for this program, very simple. So the next thing we want is the section where the code is gonna be, and that's called the dot text section. And we want to define two things here. First, we want to say that the entry point to this program is main and that it's global, so it can be found by uh, the operating system, just like a C program that starts in, dot, in main. Now we have main here as well. And the other thing we do is we're gonna cheat a bit. We're actually gonna use the printf statement that you find inside the C runtime library. And to tell the program that printf exists somewhere else in the C runtime library, we define it as an external. Okay, once we've done that, we use the word main as a label. So things here on the left that have got the two colons after them are our labels. And then everything after that is the kind of the code or the directives. Now we're gonna type in four lines of assembly, which is quite easy to get this going. The first thing you do is we're gonna push onto the stack. So push means put something onto the top of the stack. And we're gonna store, more importantly, the LR register. Okay, now the IP there is actually just a dummy because in ARM you have to store things on the stack in blocks of 64 uh, bits. You can't just put 32 bits on there when you're calling external uh, libraries, which we're going to do. We're calling printf. So the first one that we're storing there, IP, is actually just a dummy. And then we're storing the LR, which is the return address. So when the program finishes, we can actually return to where we came from. Now we get to the actual program itself. What we do is we say load. So we're now loading into register zero. And what we're going to load in there, well, we want the address string and so therefore you put this equal sign in front of it which basically says whatever this address is in memory and the compiler the assembler knows that because you can assemble this together then please put that now into r0 okay and then all we do is we say branch off to where printf it's really simple so we're going to jump off to this place called printf which is in the c runtime library and that will actually go ahead and um 
call the printf function and the parameter that's going to be passed into it is the uh, string which says hello world. And then finally at the very end what we do now is we pop off the stack. So we stack you push things on and then pop them off and we pop off our, um, our dummy uh, register there. And then rather than actually popping off LR what we actually do is we're going to say pop off into PC. And of course PC if you remember from the last video is the program counter. So what actually it's saying is Effectively, it's saying branch to whatever the value of LR was because I'm, I'm pushing, popping off from the stack the LR and it's going to be pushed into, loaded into the PC, uh, uh, the program counter, which means basically it jumps off to the return address. So it's returning to where we came from. So control X to exit out of this. And now to compile it, you use the assembler, which is AS. And we want to create a file called hello.o, an object file. And it's going to get that from hello.s. So let's run that. That worked okay. And now we're going to use GCC to link in our uh, our um, printf function that's going to call part of the C um, uh, runtime library. So we use GCC minus o for hello. That's the program we're going to create hello.o. And that's it. We now have a file called hello which there you go, a 32-bit executable, and we can run it. So there we go, let's run uh, hello. Hello world, absolutely fantastic. So that was a fairly simple program. Now let's see whether we can write a more complicated one. It's a bit longer, it's a bit more complicated, but it's worth actually just going through the steps we do now to loop round and print out uh, the, a number as we loop round. So we're gonna create a file now, loop. Uh, S, so it's going to be our source file. We do the same thing. We start with the data section. We define our string, and we're going to actually call. We're going to say that this, of course, is uh, ASCII. Uh, and what we're going to say is we're going to what we're going to print out is loop. Okay, so it's using the same syntax as you would use for the C runtime library. So we're just basically saying percent %d, which means there's going to be a parameter which says what number you want to in the percent %d you're going to print out. So it'll say loop 1, loop 2, loop 3, and so on. And we also want to define a variable called i, because of course we're trying to have a little counter here. And we're going to say that's a word. So it's not a byte, it's a word, which is 32 bits in this case. And we're going to start by saying it has a 1 inside of it. And that's it for the data section, our string and our counter. So now we go into the program itself. We need to have a dot text. We need to declare the main as the entry point again. So it becomes a dot global. And of course we want to tell it that printf is gonna be used from the, uh, from the C runtime library. And just like before, we define main as a label and then we save the LR register on the stack. Okay, and doing that at 64-bit alignment. Now, the first thing we're going to do is load uh, the register i, which we've defined up here as having the value of 1. We want to load that into a register. And so in, in assembly files, you use the at sign here for comment. So we'll say here, load i into register 2. Okay, that's what our comment is so that we know what we're doing. And the way you do that is you say load register 2. Okay, with the address of i. So just like in the previous example, we had the address of the string. Here we have the address of i. We don't know where that is in memory exactly, but the assembler does when it builds this program and turns it into machine code. And then we do this lovely neat one trick here. We say load into r2, okay, which we we're already using, the contents of the address of r2, and that's what the square brackets means. So we've loaded the address of i into r2, and then we say, hey, put into r2, the contents of the address that we've just done. That's what putting the square brackets down. So that's now loaded i into r2. Now what we're going to need is a loop because we're going to jump around in a loop here. And the first thing we're going to do in our loop is print out uh, i. So the way you do that again is the same. Load r0 with our string, which if you remember up here is like the c function, loop percent %d. OK, but what actually happens is, is that it expects the value for D here to be in the next register, which is R1. So what we say is we say move into R1 
whatever is in R2. And what's in R2? Well, R2 is I. We just loaded it here. So whatever that is. So actually, it will be 1 for now. Now, notice quickly, there is a difference here between load and move. Actually, what happens is the assembler, this kind of load is actually kind of like a slightly higher level function uh, uh, command. And what actually happens is the assembler chooses the best thing. Sometimes it might actually use move. Sometimes it does some other clever things to do with these addresses. So these are all no, almost synonymous, but actually because we're using an address here, you can use load. If you're just using between two registers, you can use uh, move. And then finally, what we do, of course, is we jump to printf, which is what we did before. If I can type it right. Okay, and that will now branch off and uh, print out the string, loop, and then the percent %d here will be with whatever is in R1. And when that returns, of course, the next thing we want to do is kind of i is equal to i plus 1. That's the next thing we want to do. So the first thing we have to do again is load into R2 the address of I. Now you might say, hold on a second, Gary, you've already done that here. R2 already has I in it. Why are you doing it again? Well, when you've branched off to do printf, the values of R0 and R1 and R2 and R3 can all change. They're not guaranteed to remain the same. So there were two ways around that. I could have pushed them onto the stack, I could have then called printf and then pulled them off the stack again to restore their state. Or in this case, I'm just going to load up i again because I know that the value in memory there is actually correct. So we do the same trick. We say load into the register of R2 the contents of the address. And then what we say is, well, move into R3. We're using a new, uh, very, a new register this time, the value of 1. Well, why are we doing that? Because we want to say add, okay, uh, the value of R2 and R3 and put the result back into R2. If you notice here, all the way along here, the first one is the destination. So load R2, move R1, add R2. It adds this and this and puts the answer here. So it adds R2 to R3 and puts it into there. So now R2 will have 2 in it because we've added it by 1. And then the finally what we want to do is we want to write that back now to the variable i, which is somewhere in memory, so that it gets permanently saved. So the way we do that is like this. We, we say load r3, which we don't need to use anymore, so we can now overwrite it, the value of i, the address of i, and now store r2 in the address of R3. Now, when it's a store, it's the other way around. It goes, we're not loading in, we're storing out. So the destination now becomes the address pointed to by R3, which of course is I, and what's going into it is R2. So that has basically added now 1 onto, uh, onto I. Of course, it's much easier in C or Python, you know, I is equal to I plus 1. But in assembly here, we do it with these steps. But of course, it's lightningly fast because it works really quickly. And now finally, what I want to say is if I is less than or equal to 10, then branch to loop. That's what we want to do. This is a comment, of course. So how do we do that? Well, you say compare r2 with 10. That's fairly easy. So you say, please tell me what is the value of r2 and is it 10 or not? And then we say branch less than or equal. So if it's less than or equal to 10, then branch to loop, please. So that will basically jump all the way back up to here, where it will print out i, it will then add 1 to it, it will then test it, and it will keep doing that until uh, i becomes 11, and then it will stop. And then how do you end the program? You do exactly like we did before. We call pop for ip and then pc, so that if you remember, the value for the uh, lr register here, okay, which was the entry point, gets popped back off the stack into the program counter, which effectively means it branches off. Okay, so that's it. So we'll just save our program. Let's see whether it's got any errors in it. We say as for the assembler, loop.o, loop.s. That worked. GCC minus O, loop, loop.o. So that will bring in the C runtime library, which will bring in our printf function. That seems to have worked. Let's do a file loop. There it is. And now let's run it. 
There you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay, so one more thing just to show you is that, that we've been talking about assembly and we've been talking about um, uh, uh, machine code. If you do an object dump, that's a command that allows you to dump, look at the content of an object file. If we look at now loop.o, which was the file that we created from our assembler, this will actually do the D, uh, disassembly. Okay, and you'll notice here that it's, look, these are exactly the instructions that we wrote, but they've actually been, for example, here, when we said string, when it's actually said, well, what I want you to do is load in the PC, uh, the current program counter, but offset by 48 bytes. So it knows that down here towards the bottom, look, 3C, 40, down here is where the program, that string is actually going to be stored in memory. And again, here, when we do a loop, we say branch equal to loop. Okay, that's actually to C, which of course is this address up here. So the assembler has worked out, but actually look, these are actually our files, that these are actually the assembly uh, commands that we typed in. And here on the left, this is the machine code. This is the amazing thing. These are actually what all these things turn out to be in actual numbers. So the final step of assembly to machine code is actually to convert these these instructions like this into actual numbers. And the processor, the CPU, knows what these numbers do. It dissects them. You know, you can see here pretty simple the E5 here, look, E59 means load, because everyone that's a load instruction starts with an E59. And then the other bits on here mean, you know, about what register it's going into and so on and so on. So you can see that this is actually the way it works. And what the CPU does is it says, oh, okay, if it's an E59, that means it's a load instruction. Let's go down this path of the logic inside the CPU to actually go ahead and finish doing what it needs to do to uh, execute that command. So that's that's the way basically it works. So there you go, we have written assembly language, we've compiled it to machine code, and we've written ourselves some programs. Okay, so there it is. I hope you enjoyed that quick look at using uh, assembly language and also a little bit about machine code there on the Raspberry Pi. In the next video on CPUs, which I'm going to make uh, soon is about how we can write our own CPU emulator and write our own assembler so we can create our own instruction set and actually model it all inside of software. Okay, my name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. If you like the video, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you know every time I drop a new video. And well, that's about it. I'll see you in the next one.